you have your Bibles with you this morning, we'd ask you to turn to Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 27, Proverbs chapter 27, just one verse, Proverbs 27, the first verse, the Bible says, boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. Dear Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your spirit. God, we pray that you would meet with us today in the spirit. Lord, that you would show the lost the way to salvation. And Lord, those of us that are saved, that you might give us uh, revival and renewal in the world in which we now live. And we pray these things in the sweet and the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Now, <clears throat> here somewhat familiar verses of Scripture. Uh, the wisest man that ever lived, according to Scripture, not according to man's idea, uh, makes a very uh, bold statement. Now, it can be both discouraging and it can be both thrilling. Uh, the entirety of my life, I've always thought, well, tomorrow I'm going to do this and tomorrow I'm going to do that. Uh, tomorrow, Lord willing, I will arrive at Paris and I will uh, pull my time and I will come home again. Uh, but if you think about that, that's very presumptuous. Even thinking that you'll get up tomorrow is a very presumptuous thought. Uh, the only reason you're really making that thought or having that idea is because it's always been that way. Every day of your life, you've always had the day before you. Now, in reality, that is just a blessing of God. Right. Every day that you broach is a new day that you can serve the Lord, but to one day they will cease to exist. Yeah. And it'll happen one or two ways. You're going to die and leave this place or the Lord will return. And the day of endless days will begin. Now, I don't know about you, but as time marches on, I'm more and more glad of bedtime as bedtime rolls around. Uh, tonight, I mean, last night, I slept in Bella's little room because we have kind of things ready in our bedroom for something else. And uh, I thought, well, I might not sleep that well, but I was out like a light. Uh, I worked hard yesterday, and plus, again, I'm not as young as I used to be, and the time is a little harder on me, works a little harder on me, and I can sleep about anywhere I lie down. Uh, fully believing and fully uh, looking forward to what the Lord's day might have tomorrow. Now, God being merciful... And good to me, I woke up with just that tomorrow that uh, I thought I would. Now, the reality is, and we, we jump over it very quickly, the reality is what tomorrow is is a blessing. It is not a guarantee. Yeah. It is not something you know will occur. It's something that God gives us. And one day, uh, if I understand the scriptures correctly, uh, they'll cease to exist. There'll be no tomorrow. There'll be, uh, there'll be no new days. And being exhausted at the end of the day, uh, you think about working the night shift. If any of you has worked the night shift, you know how it feels to go into work at 11 o'clock or night at night or, or 7 o'clock at night looking at 12 hours and the thought just exhausts me to think about it. But we'll have new bodies, we'll, have, we'll be a spiritual body before the Lord Jesus Christ and a land of no tomorrows will be exactly what we need, lasting forever and ever and ever. Amen. <coughs> if you're among the redeemed. Now, the Gospel of Luke, if you'll turn over there with me, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 12. The Gospel of Luke, chapter 12, uh, beginning 
in verse 16, uh, familiar verses, uh, a man that thought that he was guaranteed tomorrow. Uh, Luke uh, chapter 12, beginning uh, in verse 16, the Bible says, And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. Now, uh, we all like that, don't we? We all like to be successful. We all like to have money in the bank. We all like to have what we, we perceive at, less, at least as some kind of security. Yeah. Yeah. But it's not there, first of all. Your only security lies in Christ. Amen. Because one click of the mouse and the money you think you have is worth nothing. Uh, the only thing you really have, if you think about it, and that's the goodness of God, is, is the groceries you have at home right now. That's the only possession you really have that will benefit you further down the road. But we'll see that this rich man, we'll see that this successful man, he was depending on tomorrow. Yeah. He was depending on getting up. He was depending on, in fact, I believe this man was uh, pretty much thought he had many tomorrows still ahead of him just by what he did. And so we see that this man is blessed of God and, and, uh, and, and very wealthy, and he really didn't even recognize it. Don't you think that sometimes the condition of us, that we don't recognize the wealth that we do have? Uh, the wealth that, that me and Donna possess is this, is uh, uh, four children and four grandchildren. That's the consistency of our wealth. You see what I'm saying? It, it's not the thing. When we leave here, the things you have, all that's going to happen to them is your children are going to get upset and mad about them. That's about the extent of what your earthly possessions are about. I fully believe that's why Abraham had to keep moving the entirety of his 120 years is because if you don't put down roots, wealth means nothing. Yeah. Wealth means nothing. And, and so we find that as, uh, as the, the Lord Jesus is giving them this idea, that this truth, he understood wealth better than they did. Verse 17, and he thought within himself saying, what shall I do because I have no room where to bestow my fruits? Now think about why he did it. The why he didn't is this. He had all his storage area done filled up. Now, when you get to that point, what are you going to do anyway? I mean, where are you going to put it all? I remember my even my grandmother's new house that was built in about 72, I guess, had no storage places at all, almost. They just didn't have them in houses back then. And she put all her canned goods, she would put them back in the jar boxes that she got them in and shove them under the bed, and that was her cabinets. And you know what? You know when she start, stopped putting back? When there was no more place left to cram them. Makes sense, don't it? And, and this wealthy man, what could have happened to those things... Just give them to somebody. You know, it was the direction of the Lord God Almighty that they leave a certain percentage of their, their food in the field to feed the poor. Right. That, that was their plan. They didn't have food stamps. And, and so that was what God's people were to do was to provide for those that were less blessed than they were. And, and, and so we see... There was an option, there was a spiritual option, there was a blessing option, and he didn't take it. And don't get down on the rich man, that's each and every one of us as well. Verse 18, he makes a, he makes a critical error. And he said, what will I do? I mean, excuse me, and he said, this will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods, and I will say unto my soul, 
So, now, he makes a critical error, not in tearing down the barns and building new barns, new barns. That, that necessarily wasn't a bad idea. I don't think it's very charitable, but it wasn't necessarily a bad idea. But then he comes from making the carnal into spiritual. Now, I, I fully believe in the modern day that is the base problem of most churches as they began to make the carnal spiritual. Look, look, uh, look about the room this morning, and you know what? We don't have many people here, and most people will would feel sorry for us, and most people of us would be discouraged but you know what this is? This is the harvest that Christ wanted us to have. And so here we are, right? Here we are. And we find in that, don't ever think your financial success equates with spiritual blessings because it does not. I'm not going to say who it is, but I probably wouldn't matter anyway because I know they don't log in. But I had a loved one that died a couple years ago, and she made this statement, and at this point in her life, she was very, very, very confused. But she'd always been obsessed with money. And in this state of severe dementia, she says, I'm going to run to the mailbox because maybe there's a check in there. You know what that taught me? That still, in that state, that's what drove her life. That was her, that was all that she was about. Can you imagine living here more than 70 years and that still be what you're obsessed with? It oughtn't to be made among the, it oughtn't be ever named among the redeemed. Uh, but very frequently it is. Very, very often uh, we are guilty of the very same. And, and, and so, don't ever equate that into spiritual terms because you know what? The Bible says this, it rains on the just and the unjust. And just because you have lots of things and lots of money does not mean that God's with you. Right. And, and so we find, so was it for this man. So thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease. Eat, drink, and be merry. Now, we find another critical error is that he was looking at many years. Years that he did not possess. Years that he would never see. Years that did not belong to him. But he assumed they would. I assume that I'll get up and head west toward Paris. But you know what? That's an assumption. That doesn't mean it'll happen. Uh, yeah. I'm going to be dead by this time tomorrow. That's the reality of it. We don't like to talk. You know, we don't like to talk about 53-year-old men dropping dead, but they do. Uh, every time I click, I, I look at all the funeral homes obituaries every day. See if any of the people I've taken care of, because I'm not there no more, they went ahead and died. <laughs> uh, but, you know what? They're getting younger and younger. And not just because it's getting close to my age. I know that I'm on the that downhill run myself. But you're talking about people in their, in their 40s and 50s dying every day. Right. And some in their 20s and 30s. Every day. You know what? I bet they were looking ahead to a better time, don't you? I bet they thought everything was going to, and, and one day they were going to retire and enjoy all that life had to offer them, but they didn't. Now, the rich man, he was thinking along these terms, and he thought, well, uh, I'll never have to work again. I've got it all set up. Now, I want you to see the things he did not do. First of all, he did not pull down the old barns. He didn't have enough time. He did not build the new barns. He did not have time. 
In fact, the best we understand, he never even harvested the crop because he didn't have time. Don't ever be so presumptuous to think that you're going to live another 10, 15, or 20 years because that's all it is, is presumption. That all that is is really, if you get down to it, it's being boastful. It's being say, oh, you know, I'm able to do this. And so we find the man dies. But God said, verse 20, But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall those things be that thou hast provided? Now, we don't know a lot about this man, what we're reading about. And this does say, by the way, it is parable. Uh, did he have children? We don't know. Right? Did he, did he have a wife? We don't know. But if you just take the parable for what it says, he had no one. Because no one is mentioned, right? Right. When a person with no one dies, and there's not a will in place, and I don't think there was a will in place because he didn't think he was going to die, right? Who gets the stuff? The government. Right? Good old USA. And, and so we find then all his life's work amounted to nothing. You know, when I leave this place, I don't want that to be said of me, do you? I don't want it to say, be said of me, he really didn't accomplish anything. He was a nurse, big deal, all right? What did he, what, what was, what would be my accomplishments? The, the only thing I could see would be my children, my wife, my grandchildren, and what little bit of ministry that I've accomplished. That's the only things, right? And, and, and so we find then, that from the parable of the rich man, that, that, that we have to conclude that we're not always focused on the right things. Verse 21, So is he that layeth up treasure for himself, and not rich toward God. Now, being rich toward God is a lot deeper and, and a lot more entailed than tithing. Right. Uh, being rich toward God goes a lot deeper than tithing and then offering the, God, the Lord God of heaven a little bit of offering. It goes much deeper than that. The average lifespan in the United States right now, I think the last I read it, gentlemen, you have 79 years. Ladies, you have 84. That means if we, if we give of ourselves like we should, eight years dedicated entirely to the Lord. That's giving of yourself, is it not? <clears throat> Pulling up stakes and going far to a foreign country where you don't even know the language. That's giving something, right? Uh, that, that, that is committing yourself unto the Lord. And, and, and such shall, uh, such it ought to be. So we find then, <laughs> that we have to think about eternity in this realm. Because we don't know there will be a tomorrow. We, we have to evaluate ourselves in lieu of the scriptures and see where we're putting our putting, putting our uh, faith, where we're putting our trust. Now very quickly, one verse in the in the epistle of James, James chapter 4, verse 15. James chapter 4 and verse 15, the Bible says this, For what you ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. Yeah. If the Lord will. You know what? 
uh, the accurate statement, if the Lord will, I'll be in Paris tomorrow, but I don't know his will. Uh, his ways are far above my ways. I just don't know. So as we approach uh, tomorrow, and certainly as we approach eternity, if the Lord will, if, in he, if it's in his divine will, I'll wake up tomorrow. Uh, you know, have you ever really got a hold of that he's the giver of life? That means if he don't give it to you tomorrow, you'll be dead. That's the giver of life. A lot of people think of me, and it, it, it's a way to look at it, the giver of life is little newborn babies. But no, the giver of life is this, that you have the breath for the next minute. That is the giver of life. God, Jehovah, is in control of all of that for every one of us all at the same time. That, that's beyond my understanding. The giver of life. So, the next time that you think about our tomorrow, remember to reverence the Almighty and say, if the Lord will, I will be at Paris. If the Lord will, I'll be doing midwifery visits. If the Lord will, if the Lord will, because you just don't know. Sure, right. uh, getting up tomorrow is a work of the Almighty. Going to work tomorrow is the work of the Almighty. And we just don't, it, it, it's such a smooth sail for us, we just don't get it. But that is the reality of this book. Gospel of Luke, again, very familiar verses of Scripture. By the way, the uh, Bible does not say this is a parable. The Gospel of Luke, chapter 16. Uh, most of you can quote it. Luke, chapter 16, and for time's sake, we'll begin reading uh, in verse uh, 22, Luke 16 in verse 22, the Bible says this, and it came to pass that the beggar died. That's the land of tomorrow, right? Mm -hmm. uh, tomorrow, there'll be people gone that are here today. The beggar died. That's, a, that's the one certainty that I can give you this morning is that you are going to die. You are going to face death only separate and apart from the coming of Christ. Now, you that are lost, you're still going to face death. The redeemed, you know, the coming of Christ is only encouraging to the redeemed. It is not, you know, uh, before the Lord saved me, it was fearful. I was just like uh, Moses the first time he saw God and he covered his head. He said, I'm fearful. He was fearful to look upon God. That's the condition of the lost. And remember by the end of his life, he said, I, I don't care if I die or not. I just want to look at you. <laughs> that, that's a huge difference, isn't it? Yeah. That's the difference salvation makes in the life of an individual. And, and so we find that uh, tomorrow may, you may be dead. Tomorrow we may find ourselves in England funeral home. The teacher being Donna both loved in high school, just a sweet, sweet lady, good teacher, Miss Nancy Kaysen, went out into eternity yesterday. Now, I don't know if her family was expecting it or if it was sudden, but to me, Miss Nancy was young. She wasn't even 20 years older than me, I think. I think she was maybe 19 years older than me. That's sobering, is it not? That's uh, something that gets your attention quickly. And so we find we can't build on to tomorrow, so the only thing that we have to build upon is today, this present time that we have, the moment that we're now living, because the beggar died. 
And even though he was a godly man, I want you to see that, he died anyway. And you may be a Christian, you may be born again, but separate and apart from coming of Christ, you'll die too. Notice the ending of that verse. It says of the beggar that he died and was carried by angels into Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also died and was buried. And in hell, he, meaning the last person we spoke about, the rich man, and in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, plural, and seeing Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. They both died. Now, if you'll remember the context of, of this, and again, it does not say it's a parable, so I'm assuming it was a real event, prior to uh, the resurrection of Christ because we find that Abraham's bosom is still intact. And, uh, and, and, and he goes, they died on the same night. Now you remember the health condition of the little beggar. Said that he had big sores on him. I'm assuming leprosy. I don't know that, but some kind of big sores. And he begged, he was hungry, he wanted something to eat. And the dogs, it never says, it says he was desiring to be fed from the crumbs that fell from the rich man's table. It never really says if he got the, the nourishment or not. He may have, he may not have. And the rich man was feasting uh, sumptuously. I don't know what he had, what was before him. I'm assuming he was Jewish. So probably some kind of beef or, or some kind of animal that chews its food and, and, and vegetables and nice things. And it says nothing of his health. So I'm assuming his health was good. It says that it is not saying that he has any weeping sores or anything like that. So I'm assuming he's stable. But they both died. There were no tomorrows for either one of them. They both kicked the bucket. And they both faced the Almighty. We see that Lazarus went into the bosom of the Lord. I mean, in the bosom of Abraham, which was at that time where the redeemed went. And we see that immediately he, the rich man is tormented in the flames. In tomorrow, there are two things, two options, two places, and that is in the glory of heaven at the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ, or it's still in hell today. That's the land of tomorrow. Very, very humbling, is it not? Can you imagine? Can you, can you fathom? thinking that the land of tomorrow is not the bosom of Christ. That just, that, that just makes me shake in my boots that the end result may be far to the other. That's why we need the assurance of Christ, is it not? That's why we need to know that we know that we know. Make your calling and election sure. And so we find each of them where, where, where they were. <laughs> and he cried, meaning the rich man, and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. I want you to see the flames of hell does not change the nature of mankind. You know, uh, he still saw Lazarus as nothing but a beggar, nothing but someone that was off to serve him and do for him. He saw him as nothing. You know, the Bible says this, that every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that he is Lord. But they are not going to do that <laughs> like this. They probably have to be thrown down and crammed down and... Uh, then they'll acknowledge who God is. And you know why? Because their nature is against it. It's against it in every way. They, they, they won't. <laughs> His nature was not changed by the fires of hell. That's what I'm saying. And neither is anybody else's. 
The Bible says they would gnash on one another in their teeth. You know why? Because they're still lost, they're still wicked, and they still don't care about inflicting pain on other people. Their nature has no redemption, so they remain exactly the same. But Abraham said, Son, remember thou in thy life receiveth good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And besides all this, between us and you there's a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from thence from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to pass, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. And when he then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. And you know the rest, and Abraham, no, 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 that's not possible. And he says, even on top of that, if they did, they wouldn't listen. No. Uh, they, they wouldn't give God honor. They wouldn't let him know who he is. So tomorrow, we may find ourselves in the pits of hell. If we don't know the Lord Jesus Christ and we die, I can tell you assuredly, that's exactly what you'll find. If you've never been redeemed, that's your lot. But what a wonderful thing to go into the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. See, that's why I'm not fearful. If there's no tomorrow for me, don't worry because I'll be with the Lord. And I am very, very fine with that. I'm very okay with that to be with the Lord Jesus Christ forever and ever. Amen. And so we find <laughs> that tomorrow <laughs> is coming. <coughs> Acts chapter 7. We're going to conclude. Acts chapter 7, verse 52. Very familiar verses of Scripture, the stoning of Stephen. Acts chapter 7 and verse 52. The Bible says this. The middle of Stephen's sermon getting toward the end. Which of the prophets or the preachers or the predictors, which of the prophets have you not persecuted? Because they didn't get what they wanted. And they have slain which shewed before the coming of the just one, of the coming of whom you have been now the betrayers and murderers. Now, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll tell you from experience, people don't like truth. Redeemed people do, some, and lost people hate it. That's their nature. That's who they are. They despise the fact that they have an inability to approach God, and He comes to them. They hate that. They, they, they hate the fact that they were born corrupt. They hate that. They hate and this is the one they hate the most, that God is sovereign over all. And he calls the shots, yeah. and they don't. They despise that. Because they want to call the shots. They want to give their life to Jesus. They want to deny the deity of Christ. They want to, there isn't even a God. And you know why they don't want God? Because if, you, if God exists, you have to be accountable to him. Right? They really don't have an issue with God. They just don't want to be accountable to God. And so they make up the myth that there is no God. And, and, and so we see that Stephen was kind of telling them how it is, saying, hey, you're supposed to be God's people. You were supposed to be the nation of the elect, and you're the one that killed him. Verse 53, 53, who have received the law by the depositions of angels and not kept it. He said, you had the law. You understood who Christ, God was. And when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed on him with their teeth. Now, uh, who else? Do we know that the Bible records that gnashed on one another in, with their teeth? The people cast into hell, right? They, they're showing their nature, are they not? 
They're showing who they are. They're showing that they are without redemption. Verse 55, Stephen doesn't get upset about it, but he, being full of the Holy Ghost, man, why do we get upset at that term? Why do we try to minimize it? You know what? There's times I've preached in the flesh, and there's times that I've had the help of the Holy Ghost, and I'll tell you, the second one's a lot better than the first. And we find that Stephen is preaching in the Holy Ghost in spite of literally being bitten at the very time. You know where you get help like that? It comes from God. Because I don't know about you, if somebody bites me, our biting youngin was Adam, man, he could bring the blood. You know, you know how I broke him? I bit him back. <laughs> but Stephen didn't do that, did he? He continued to preach. In the face of opposition, continue to preach. Continue to put the continue to put the word out there. And he being full of the Holy Ghost looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God, which according uh, to 1 Corinthians 11 is Jesus, and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. He was standing up because he was fixing to, to welcome another one home. And you know what it said concerning Stephen? They dragged him out of town. They started stoning him. But verse 60 says this. Didn't say that he died, which he did. But it said he fell asleep. And the pure opposition of the devil himself. He fell asleep. Comfort and peaceful, knowing Christ in a few moments he would, he would be in the presence of the Lord. He fell asleep. <coughs> I want that kind of peace when there's no tomorrow, don't you? I want that kind of ease when I leave this place. Now, if you're blessed enough to see the coming of Christ, when we go up, the Bible says we have to be changed, mm -hmm. right? Be changed from what we got now to what we'll have up then. And you wouldn't want to know why there's no tomorrow there. We got to be equipped to stay awake for eternity. To praise Him throughout the ceaseless ages. We're not equipped to do that right now. But we will be. Do you really know the Lord Jesus Christ? I know I emphasize that a lot, but that's that's the best advice that I can give you. Do you really, really know Jesus? Have you ever called about out to him? Nothing Armenian about this. The Bible says it's Paul's first mission trip. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. So simple, is it not? Don't worry about predestination. Worry if you know Christ. Place Place yourself at his feet. Do you genuinely know him? It's very, very necessary.